For those of you who may not know, my name is Jarvis Williams, um, affectionately sometimes known as Baba J throughout my community. Uh, again, I'm very happy and excited to be here this morning. I have some people who are assisting me this morning. Um, Mrs. Carissa Perla is going to be doing our translation for anyone who needs it. I have the amazing Teresa Perez. She uh, is always on top of me in the office and I know she'll be on top of me in this presentation, making sure that I stay on track and on time. If you want to engage in the chat box, she will assist with uh, questions, answers, and anything that she can do to assist you. And we are going to be taking a journey today through what I call the blackmail code. Um, when I was first asked to do this task, I was kind of like, this is huge. It's, it's, it's kind of like trying to boil the ocean, if you will. It's such a huge and complex topic and subject matter. So to kind of be specific this morning and narrow it down, I just want to take a glance into the historical trauma and the impacts that it has had on Black masculinity because the subject, again, too large to try to tackle in, in, in one 45-minute session. So um, as we journey through the Black Male Code, please feel free to come off mute. Please feel free to interact. This is going to be a highly engaging uh, conversation um, over the next few minutes. So with that said, again, to everybody, I say welcome. Um, just to reinforce here, the, the objective today for today's Black Male Code will basically be to examine the impacts of trauma and its effects in shaping Black masculinity, hopefully reframing the consciousness of how Black masculinity is perceived. Um, in my pursuit of tackling the subject matter, as I said, it was a gigantic topic. Um, I couldn't find a common theme. Um, it, it's not something that has a specific de definition in any textbook or any of the online platforms. When, when looking at Black masculinity, I've watched a lot of documentaries. Um, I've watched some uh, high profile doctors that have given some dissertations and some interviews and things of that nature. And what I found is that it is really a very complex topic. Um, I also found that a lot of people have a lot of different opinions when it comes to Black masculinity. And so I figured since so many people have opinions, I would like to get your opinion. I would like for you all to join me if you can pull out your smartphones, your cellular devices, and go to this website here, www.menti.com.join. We will enter this code here and I'm going to pull that up on my screen so that in real time, as you input these words that define black masculinity to you, I would love to hear what you have to say to kind of set the stage as we go on about our conversation. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pop over to my secondary screen and then we can begin. And this. Give me one second. We're gonna go with a continuation of the first one. Are you guys able to see that okay? No? Okay. Yes. It's Somebody? not focused, there's too many things. So you have oh, to- Oh, okay, it. I got you. It's small. I got you. One second. Is it, how is that? All right. So Perfect. everybody have the code? I don't really know how to do this. So okay, so when you go to mentimeter.com.join, you're going to use the code, and the code, uh, Teresa, if you can put this in the chat box, is 648-883-46. And then you should get a screen that allows you to populate words that you believe describes Black masculinity to you. Okay. Is that clear? You. Yes, thank you. Okay. No problem. Is everybody getting it okay? Mr. Williams, can you repeat the link again, please? It is the, you want the link or you want the code? Link. It's www 
dot menti, M E N T I dot com dot join. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. And once you've made your uh, inputs, take about two minutes. Don't want to rush anybody, but um, just go ahead and submit those and let's see what we think. Okay, I see some action going on there. So we got courage, we got strength. I saw one person that put it in. We're getting more, Mr. Williams. We're getting more. Yeah, I'm seeing it. It's growing. It's growing. <laughs> Strong, courage, family, courageous, judged, mm, misunderstood, evolving and important. Historically mangled, leadership, cheated, original, hardworking, good feedback, diverse, spiritual, special, all right. Christina said, strain, courage, and patience. All right, thank you. thank you so much, Christiane. Resilient, that is a great word. Tired, hmm. graceful, rage under control. Wow. All right, I'll give it just a couple more seconds. I think everybody should have had an opportunity. All right, and then I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can go back to my presentation. If you give me just one second here. All right. So talk to me, just a little brief conversation. Um, what, what did it feel like? Was anybody surprised by what they saw? Um, did you did you think something different was up there or what, what were your expectations? Just curious. Don't be shy. You can come off a of mute and share. Can, can you put the, the uh, words back up? Oh, yeah. You guys want to see them? I can put them back up. Um, let me stop sharing. Let's share that screen again. There we go. Can you guys see that all right? All yes. right. There's a word I'm looking for before I make my statement after I hear from you guys. Um, I, <laughs> I'm not surprised by any of the, the um, words that are there. Um, 
I, I think I couldn't find a word myself for rage under control or pay, I, I said patience, but I, I just feel that there's a um, real strong um, ability to not express rage, a righteous, justifiable rage. So I, I don't really have a word for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who was that that just shared? Uh, Christiane. Christiane, thank you so much. I appreciate that. That rage under control definitely was um, one that stood out for me. Anybody else that would like to share? Resilience. Resilience. Uh huh. So the word misunderstood, I, I feel like um, it, it really is to me misrepresented. Mm. Mm -hmm. I've been presented with an idea of a black man, and and that's what was presented to me. And as I've grown older, I've realized that it was a misrepresentation. Mm. Thank you for sharing. I appreciate that, Miss Juanita. Charlie, were you going to share? Uh, I just said tired. Tired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can relate. Definitely agree. Um, you know what was interesting? And I'm hoping that I'm just not overlooking it. Something that I did not see up there. Um, is father. I didn't see the word father. And that was just interesting to me that it that it wasn't there. Um, but that poses the question for me. Uh, when we think about black masculinity, for the most part, many of these words represent us in a very amazing way, right? Um, we're inspired, we're powerful, we're strong, we have courage, we are loving, um, we're confident, we're beautiful, we're diverse, we are thoughtful, we're evolving, we're graceful, we have leadership skills, we're needed. Um, those words, inspirational, show up more than the negative words, but is that how the black man is often depicted? Does that Absolutely. align with the story that the media tells us? No. <laughs> yeah. Just kind of some food for thought, right? I can't see everybody. So Teresa, I don't know if anybody else has their hands up or not before I jump back to my presentation. No, you're good to go. Unless they want to share. All right. Thank you so much. Watch your eyes. I'm gonna stop share. Back to the presentation. So thank you guys for doing that. I, I just like to do that. And it was very interesting to me. One, it allows for some interaction and um, because as I stated, when I started out on this project and it being huge, you can't find a definition for it. And um, one of the things that I found is many people would say, especially black men is that, well, everybody gets to tell us who we are except for ourselves. And so I just thought, well, in the spirit of that, I would love to hear what a, a group of people think. So um, with that being said, I wanted to jump into what, I believe is close to the black man code, black masculinity. This is nothing special that I created. Um, there is this thing known as the man box. It exists amongst many, many cultures and it's pretty common. Um, but this is something that I think specifically speaks to a lot of African-American males that happen and occur very early on in life. Um, you have to be heterosexual. There is no opportunity to be gay, to be queer, to be anything or. So now you've just extracted a bunch of people out of the box or you've caused people to try to conform themselves to fit into it. Um, don't act like a girl. Anything that can be considered acting like a girl is automatically in line with number three. It's a sign of weakness. We're always supposed to be dominant, always in control. Never an opportunity to emote anything that resembles real emotions unless it's anger, right? And someone so beautifully put in our word cloud, rage under control. Someone put in the word cloud tired. Is that possibly why we're tired trying to conform to all of these demands? 
trying to fit into the black male code, trying to fit into the black male box can be a very, very difficult. Um, you know, oftentimes as, as, as black men, we grow up with this understanding that, you know, you never let them see you sweat. You're always supposed to run faster. You're always supposed to jump higher. You're always supposed to work harder, right? And unfortunately, that is the reality for a lot of black men. Most black men, even the ones that have proven themselves to be successful, will tell you I had to work 10 times harder than any of my male counterparts in a different ethnicity group to get here. Right. A, a, a black man will have to have three PhDs just to get a seat at a table that a Caucasian man might necessarily have to. So a lot of these stigmatisms are put and placed on black men at a very, very young age. And so when we look at that, we have to begin to think about why that is and how that shapes out. Um, and we find here that uh, one of the dopest writers that I like, he was an uh, African activist, goes by the name of Steve Biko. In the 60s and 70s, he did a lot of great work. And in the late 70s, he was assassinated. But this is, this is how Mr. Biko broke it down. He said, it becomes necessary to see the truth as it is. If you realize that the only vehicle for change are these people who have lost their personalities, right? These black men who have come here by way of being stripped from a country, separated from their families, language robbed from them, traditions taken from them, any type of ability to see what a black man in charge really looks like and not in rage, has been taken away from them. So they have no personality. But in order to correct that, he says, the first step is that we therefore make the black man come to himself, pump life back into his body, that empty shell, infuse him with pride and with dignity to remind him of his complicity in the crime of allowing himself to be misused, therefore letting evil reign supreme in the country of his birth. I, I love that Dr. Muhammad, um, and I had to attribute him because I, I had this quote and I, I didn't use it, but it so perfectly aligns with this quote here where he, quote, he quoted um, Immortal Technique. And basically what Steve Biko is saying is the same quote that Dr. Muhammad used. If the solution has never been to look inside, how is it that you can expect to find it anywhere else? I believe that what Mr. Steve Biko was telling us is that as black men, we have to learn to look within ourselves to answer the call of really being able to define what black masculinity is, really being able to tell our stories. I do believe that oftentimes it is very hard and we are a very oppressed people. So being in control of the narrative has been very hard. And I wanna take a look today at why that's been so hard and been such a challenge for our people, for black men in particular. Um, so it brought me to the question that who is the black man really? He's been forced to contend with a lot. We've inherited a 400 year historically, our history of socially and racially constructed masculinity and emotional trauma for which we must sort through and try to come to terms with on a daily basis. This is a difficult process. Just think about trying to come to terms with something when there's no father in the home, there's no mentorship, there's no guidance, and you come all the way back to the 1600s, which we now know of modern day Angola, right to the banks of Jamestown, Virginia, in shackles, in chains, sick, sleep, and sick, and enslaved. The black man arrived here oppressed. He's been romanticized because we said a lot of beautiful things about the black man, but then we're demonized. We're criminals, we're thugs, we're hoodlums, we're everything under the sun except a child of God or except a great upstanding citizen because the way we're often depicted, as someone else said, misrepresented and misperceived because our emotions are misunderstood. No ability to get control over what's going on. See, oppression, the, the, the cruel treatment that continues to happen, we see it in our school districts. We see it in our court systems. We see it with police officers, teachers, 
and it continues to happen. And so what happens to a group of people when they continue to go through a process? We're talking about 400 years. Most people don't even give credit to the fact that black people in this country have been free-ish for less time than we were enslaved. There, black people in this country were slaves longer than we've actually been what is considered to be free in current day and time. And when I say free-ish, just think about the fact that there's nearly two and a half million people incarcerated, two and a half million men incarcerated in this country and African-American men make up 41% of that. Two and a half million men and nearly half of them are African-American men. I heard a doctor say it this way. If a hundred kids show up at school and they all drink from one fountain, it is okay to write a prescription if those kids all get some sort of virus that causes them to start vomiting. But is it better to just give every child a prescription or is it maybe better to look at the fountain that's causing the illness? I think that there's been illness in this country that has caused some great effects in determining how the black man in this country is perceived that has detrimentally shaped what black masculinity is. But I don't think anything is really being done to look at how do we fix this problem? How do we how do we begin to move forward? And so with that, it kind of takes me to what I believe is really shaping black masculinity in this country. And it's trauma. Trauma is an emotional response to an, a to a terrible event like a car accident, rape, natural disaster. Immediately after these events, shock or denial are very typical. The long-term reactions include unpredictable emotions. Is that unpredictable emotions? Those things that we talked about earlier that black men are not supposed to have, not supposed to express. So now that thing that is uncontrollable that I never learned how to express as a kid, here I am in traumatic situations throughout the scope of black masculinity and trying to cover up those uncontrollable emotions. It's like continuing to put trash in a trash can and never dealing with the fact that eventually it'll begin to stink. Eventually it'll begin to overflow if we don't take out the trash. Flashbacks, strained relationships, even physical symptoms like headaches and nausea. While these feelings are normal, some people have difficulty moving on with their lives. And the only real way to help that is through some form of counseling, visiting with the psychologist, but we all know that black men don't visit counselors and psychologists quite often. We actually only make up 4% of the psychologists in the world. So is it likely that black men are gonna go and get help from the same people that look like people who have mistreated them? Probably not. It's just not common. Other research and statistics show that black men are at least 17 times more likely to experience some form of sexual abuse, criminal activity, physical abuse, early childhood abuse, community violence, and all of these within themselves, if they never went to the military, lead to PTSD. And most often they go very highly unaddressed. So it gets me to thinking, Trauma is not always just for the person who experiences the event, but you can witness the event and that can be traumatic. So then it makes me wonder as the world is watching black men encounter these continuous traumatic experiences, are we not all traumatized? Are we all traumatized to the same extent? Are we all traumatized to the same degree? And this is only continuing to perpetuate an ever-growing problem that once again, it is shaping black masculinity. 
And again, this is just such a small portion of it because in 50 minutes trying to tackle a huge topic is just a, a great undertaking. But understanding trauma, I believe, is, is, is a great entry point into looking at Black masculinity because you could do an entire seminar on this entire thing. After you've acknowledged the trauma, you begin to look at the facts and statistics. And these are almost mind blowing themselves. See, according to research conducted in 2016, it's sad that the last time this research was actually conducted was in 2016. But we find that black men are 50% more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia and depression. And then we just learned in our last slide that when the trauma occurs, we don't seek help. Black men incarcerated six times the rate of white men. We are 13% of the population as African-Americans. Black men are only 48% of that 13%. So there's more women in our country than there are men. And we are six times more likely to be arrested and incarcerated than that of white men. That is a problem. Black men disproportionately impacted by gun violence. And that can be due to homicide. That can be due to just regular gun injury or fatal police shootings. I don't have, I could go on and on listing the, the, the Emmett Till situations, the um, Tamir Rice's and the variety of young black men that we know. And those are just the ones publicized in mass media. What about the ones that don't even go reported in our nation on a daily basis? So the trauma is real. And what's, what's really sad about the trauma being so real is that we have a system to address it, but is the system working? Again, how long do we keep allowing children to drink from a contaminated water fountain and not expect the problem to spill over into so many other areas of the country as we know it. Progression of trauma. This is where it really starts to hit home. If you look at black men coming into this country in the 1600s, we went from ships, shackles to cotton fields. When it seemed like it gotten better, it was from cotton fields into the uh, Jim Crow laws and the civil rights movement, which led to burning crosses and KKK. These are all traumatic experiences. When most black men couldn't defend their families, couldn't provide uh, efficiently for their families. And we see this is still occurring today. Even when you look at, is there anyone by chance bes besides uh, Mr. Irving that knows who the gentleman is in the last photograph here? Yes. Who is that, Brittany or Ms. Harrell? Was that you? I can't tell who's coming off mute because I'm in presenter mode. Uh, oh, this is Christiane Anderson. That's oh, okay, Christiane, who is that young man? Uh, the young man who was killed by the three white men mm -hmm. uh, who was jogging. Uh-huh. And they're now on trial for hate crimes. Yes, ma'am, it is. You know his name by chance? I can't. <laughs> no problem. I mean, so this is Mr. Ahmad Aubrey. That's what and, Juanita and, said. Aubrey. Oh, okay. In the chat? Yes. yes. Mr. Aubrey, he was just, he was gunned down and killed by three white men. And this happened in 2020. So from 1600s to 2020, have we come very far? Is the trauma still real? Is it still prevalent? And the thing about progressive trauma um, a lot of research would suggest and has indicated that historical trauma can actually be passed on from generation to generation to generation. So we look at the, the, the beautiful story that Dr. Muhammad shared this morning at the start of the session, right? You have this amazing story about this young man and life turned out beautifully for him. But just think about what kind of trauma went through his bloodline as he was being carried in the womb of his mother who lost her husband. That played out and that affected him and that shaped him. And so these, there, there's been research where they've used rats in labs and something as simple as a cherry just to show how trauma is definitely passed on from generation to generation. So was it safe to say that black men today carry the trauma of black men from hundreds of years ago? I think so. And I think that we have to be able to 
take a, a close look at where that's taking us and how that plays out and how that shapes out and what we are trying to define as black masculinity because black men haven't been put in a position to be in control of the narrative. And I can tell you, I know more black fathers who are in the home, who are providers, who are married, who are great fathers. Um, many of them are on here today, but our narrative is not generally told. So what does that tell a little kid? What, what, do our, what do our black boys believe when they belong to school districts where the highest position they may see is a, is a security guard or a custodian? Do they, they don't see, I don't believe I can be a principal. I, I don't believe I can be a dean of students because that's not, this is why so many of our black boys want to be NBA stars and NFL players because that's the greatest place. They, they want greatness. They believe it's possible, but they can only look to the place where they can actualize it and where they can visualize it. And because of trauma, they can't visualize it in many places because it's not something that they are seeing before them on a consistent basis. I thought this was an amazing quote by Mr. Tupac Shakur. He said, death is not the greatest loss in life. Rather, it is what dies inside of a man while he is still living. How many black boys have dreams that have died in them because they've been traumatized? They've experienced things like um, racial profiling. They have experienced things like the invisibility syndrome. They have been traumatized by teachers, by parents, by schoolmates, by experiences. And then again, remember, you don't have to be the direct recipient. They've been traumatized by what they've seen in social media. The images that they see of themselves in the news. The, the, the images that they see of black men everywhere they look can be traumatizing. And so would that cause your dreams to die inside of you? Would that, would that cause you to maybe um, drift from where you were, what you were supposed to be from living out your full potential? I think that it's safe to say that it can. And what, what I'm seeking to do here is kind of set the stage because I can give you trauma from so many perspectives. I can break down PTSD, but we're all well-educated and we all know it. What I wanted to do was set a stage so that for a few moments, we could have a healthy conversation. This is a safe place and I'm hopeful that we have the courage. I believe that we do have the courage to have that conversation because I want to pose a question for you this morning and I will even give you a moment to think about it. i like for you to imagine for just a moment, maybe a trauma that you experienced yourself. I would like to think, I would like for you to think about what it was that you needed or what you received or did not receive that helped you to overcome that trauma. And I'd like to just talk about that for a few moments this morning, if you will. So I'm hopeful that you guys will all have the courage to. We had a great discussion earlier. Some awesome things came out of our discussion. And I would really love to hear from you guys as we talk about our own traumatic experiences for a moment and some things that you feel you needed or would need to overcome those traumatic experiences. Um, if you want to share in the chat box, you're also free to do that. You can raise your hand. Mrs. Teresa will help me out in um, making sure that I don't miss anybody. Mr. Williams, would you like to share one of your stories that maybe you've gone through? Uh, yeah, I, I can. Um, I think something that was traumatic for me is um, I was very fortunate. I did grow up in an all black community. Um, it was a very safe place. I grew up in Indio, California. Um, I grew up in a little area called Nairobi. Um, I was very fortunate. I did pretty well in school. I was able to go off to college and I went to San Diego State. Um, I think one of the de detriments, you know, my father not being present in the home, I was not exposed to what life was like outside of my community. It was very sheltered. My church was down the street. This was back in the 80s. There, this wasn't during a time where kids went all the places that kids can go today. And what actually occurred for me is, um, you know, my, my mother did pretty well for herself, the support of my grandparents. So I lived a pretty decent life. 
But in moving to San Diego, I remember an experience where I went into Macy's um, and I was shopping for a suit for Easter. Something that was common that I did as a, as a child growing up here in the Valley. And I just remember the feeling of walking through the mall and um, walking through Macy's, excuse me, and a lady following me. And I recall her um, asking me if I knew that the suit was $300 as to imply if I couldn't afford it or maybe I shouldn't be handling that particular garment. And I just remember being enraged. And I don't think that I was even prepared for how to meet that challenge. And again, goes back to what we talked about, right? Just not knowing how to contain those emotions. Um, and I'll be honest, I had a very unpleasant exchange for her. But once again, very fortunate. I, I didn't get arrested or have any bad situation that arose out of it. But it was a very traumatic situation that stood with me for a while. And it actually made me feel some kind of way towards certain people. And so um, I had to learn how to kind of internally work through the process of being able to deal with those emotions. And it also was the thing that kind of opened up my eyes to, to life and to reality because I had a few experiences. I had some run-ins with police officers being stopped for things that weren't true, um, experiencing you know, what it was like to walk out of a store and walk past a car and have someone lock their doors. you know. And I didn't fit any of those demographics. I've never been arrested, never went to jail, never stole anything, but the rage that I felt on the inside and what am I doing? I'm operating in what I was told as a kid. Don't express any emotions except anger. And by the time I hit my 20s, it was just bursting out of me and I didn't know what to do. So um, that, that just kind of like a small series of traumatic experiences that I had, you know, um, my father wasn't present. You know, my parents went through a very bad divorce. You know, it took me later in life to even understand that my father was responding to his own trauma. So I think that these traumatic experiences, um, they exist all around us. And, and it can be very difficult to, um, to contend with as black men. And so it goes back to, you know, earlier in the presentation, trying to deal with something when you don't have a blueprint for what it looks like. I think it speaks to kind of why we're here today, um, you know, in, in running rites of passage programs, which was something that I've done for the last 10 years prior to coming to the school district. I greatly understand why there's such a need for black male mentorship programs because um, kids need to see black men in order to help them understand what black masculinity looks like. What does it really look like when you're angry? How do you treat a, a, a young lady? How do you respond in a situation when you are um, upset? Jarvis, can you see? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Charlie. Oh, I was just going to tell him I, I have a the story may be a little bit similar to that. Um, and when I was about uh, 18, 19 years old, um, I was pulled over by law enforcement and um, set on the curb um, for no reason, pulled over, set on the curb. Um, it happened to be big, large sprinklers around. So the sprinklers were moving backwards and forwards and they were wetting me. The whole time I was sitting on the sidewalk and he was taking even longer because he knew that I was sitting there getting soaking wet. Mm. And it was no reason for the stop um, except for the, to humiliate me. And I had to sit there while he took his time writing a ticket and he told me if, he got, if I got up, he would shoot me. So I had to sit there and get soaking wet by a sprinkler in Palm Springs, California, to say the least. You would never imagine that in a city like Palm Springs, something like that would happen. But um, it, 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 hurt, it hurts, which a lot of people will never say it hurts. And mm -hmm. it's disappointing because the idea of a police officer is to protect and serve. Mm -hmm. And to feel like as a young child that he just set you on the curb to humiliate you and let you know that he was in charge and that you basically were nothing as a teenager. It's, it's very disheartening and just disappointing. And, and that was just one of the experiences I had with law enforcement. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate that, Mr. Irving. It's, um, I, I, I like that you said that. 
Is somebody else sharing? Were you going to share, Miss Juanita? Um, I just I just wanted to share something very quickly. So absolutely. Uh, when I started making money, um, I thought you know, and I moved into a nice neighborhood in Palm Springs, and I thought, well, now I'm going to be accepted by everyone because now I have money. Now I live in a nice house and I drive a nice car. And what ended up happening was I went for a walk one afternoon, you know, one afternoon, like a week after moving into the, my home. And um, two of my neighbors called the police because I looked suspicious. And the mm. police officer asked if he could give me a ride home. Uh, we told him where I lived, I just lived down the street. This is my neighborhood. So he very carefully, you know, followed me as I walked back home, watched me walk in the house and then drove away. So not not as traumatic as what Charlie went through, obviously, and obviously I'm not a black man, but that misconception I had that somehow having money and living in a nice place was going to eliminate my race and it didn't. <laughs> right. Thank you. And I, th I think, thank you so much. I think that's one of the, the deep complexities, right? Is that unfortunately sometimes as black men, we, we seek and we pursue peace. You know, I know Mr. Irving pretty well. You know, he's a very peaceful person. Um, he loves kids. He's very adamant about supporting children. Um, and I know that a lot of times he's met with resistance. And I know emphatically that he's met with resistance that, and in, as much as I hate to say this, but if he was a white gentleman, he would not be met with the same resistance. And this is what makes the piece about black masculinity so difficult. You know, as I said earlier, many people don't think about the fact that, wow, like black people have actually, they were enslaved longer than they've been free. What would life look like for black people? We had a 200 year head start. Starting our businesses, corporations, money, finances. And you look at black, look at what black men and women built in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the success burned down to the ground, Black Wall Street. So even when a little bit of success comes, it's like the carpet is snatched from under you. And these are those difficult pieces and they're the hard conversations and they cause us in our biases to show up in places where do we always give little black boys a fair shot? And so if this is passed down from generation to generation, what, what, what really begins to happen when I'm just a product of a father who didn't get a fair shake? Who was the product of a father that did, did not get a fair shake? How does that continue to show up? That's that oppression, that long overdue, harsh treatment. And when we're honest, as, as very well spelled out in the presentation, from the 1600s to 2020 to 2022, I'm pretty confident we are just fresh into the second month of 2022. I could go online and I can at least find 15 black men that have been gunned down and killed by a police officer. I could also find some black men that are killed by other black men. And all of these are things that come about as a result of trauma that has been placed upon us, and again, not giving us very much leverage to be in control of the narrative and what that looks like. And so it's just something to think about, you know. Um, Teresa, I don't have, do I have anybody else in the comments or? Um, Ms. Annie um, Axum, she share in the comment. She said, what comes to mind for me are instance of um, sexist, sexism and feeling enraged that it was being treated differently because I am a woman and instance of a man thinking I know less, can live less, can do less, whatever. It won't let me read the rest. Okay. I can share aloud if that's easier. Thank you. Go right ahead. I just, I mean, I again, not even close to the same experience of what you've shared, but you asked, what do we need in those instances of traumatic experiences? And to me, the biggest thing that I always need is acknowledgement that it happened, that if I tell someone this happened to me mm -hmm. and it hurt, that they say, yes, I believe you that happened to you and this happens in the world. And I think it's, it just furthers the trauma when people say, no, you must have imagined it. Surely it didn't happen that way or they didn't mean that. And you know 
you know what happened to you and you need others to know it too. Absolutely. That secondary trauma, right? I, I, I told someone about my traumatic experience and I didn't get the support and the love that I should have gotten um, to handle it, to ensure that, you know, my, my, my dignity was left intact, right? And so then this leads to next time I won't say anything, right? And now we're back to boiling over and, 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 and spilling over with, with anger and with rage because the emotions have been mishandled. Um, we got about two minutes left. Um, did anybody else have a comment they wanted to add? I wanted to leave us with one last quote before we went back in. So, um, oh, can I say something, Jarvis? Yes, go right ahead. Um, in the in the chat, I um, I left a message, and I just want to say thank you to all of the the people that are in this room that are of a different race. It means a lot that you guys are even in this class and want to learn and want to, you know, find out about how we feel as black men. It's really important. And I just want to say thank you guys for taking your time out of your day to, to join this class. It's, it means a lot to us. Absolutely. Thank you, Charlie. You stole the words right out of my mouth, but I, I could not have said that any better. I definitely appreciate each and every one of you. Um, and I appreciate those of you who, um, who shared as well. I did want to just say that uh, as we go out, I think that I love this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. It says, the love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy to a friend. When you are not willing to, as Miss Annie said, hear, listen, and believe, um, you present yourself as an enemy. And a lot of times people don't even realize that in the minds of black boys and men, it is hard to see you as anything else other than an enemy when, as Charlie said, you're not willing to at least hear my story. At least let us know that we're seen and that we have a voice. We want you to see color. Um, so I do echo what he said. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if there's anyone in this session that was left with emotions or feelings that may have come up that you are not feeling complete with or whole with,